You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon, and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Before the war, the United States Air Force strongly believed in targeting specific industrial sites rather than bombing entire cities. Initially, American bombers tried to pinpoint their targets in Germany with precision. However, this approach encountered several obstacles. About half of the American bombing runs over the last 20 months of the European conflict shifted to broader attacks that did not rely on visual sighting, including significant operations over Berlin, Dresden, and other cities through Operation Clarion. During these missions, the United States mainly dropped high-explosive bombs, with only 14% being incendiaries, a stark contrast to the British strategy, which leaned heavily on incendiary bombs 21% and targeted German urban centers from early 1942 until the war's end. Such tactics led to the devastating loss of civilian lives and massive firestorms in cities like Hamburg and Dresden. On another front, Japanese forces consistently bombed Chinese urban areas, aiming to terrorize civilians rather than hitting industrial targets. Chongqing, serving as China's temporary capital, suffered extensively from these air raids. Meanwhile, the first American airstrike on Tokyo during the war was the Doolittle Raid on the 18th of April 1942, which caused minimal damage. A more focused campaign against Japan began in June 1944 with B-29 bombers flying from China, though Tokyo remained out of their reach until the bases were established in the Mariana Islands in October 1944. This relocation allowed for comprehensive reconnaissance and planning for a systematic bombing campaign against Japanese cities, starting with a detailed surveillance of Tokyo in November. Initially, the bombing strategy against Japan aimed at precision strikes on crucial industrial sites with a gradual shift toward firebombing urban areas. The first directive to the 21st Bomber Command specified aircraft and engine factories as primary targets, albeit acknowledging the possibility of broader city attacks if needed. This dual approach was overseen by General Henry H. Arnold through the unique structure of the 20th Air Force. Yet, the initial precision bombings of Tokyo and other cities faced setback due to weather and mechanical issues, leading to a change in command with Major General Curtis LeMay taking over in January 1945. With pressure to produce results, LeMay shifted the focus towards widespread area bombing, aiming for a turnaround in the campaign's effectiveness. In 1943, the United States Army Air Forces started planning for a firebombing campaign targeting Japanese cities. Japan's key industrial operations were mainly situated in a few large cities, with a significant portion of their manufacturing happening within homes and small workshops in urban zones. These planners figured that setting incendiary bombs loose on the six biggest cities in Japan might damage nearly 40% of these industrial sites and could result in the loss of 7.6 million months worth of work. They also believed such attacks would kill over half a million people leave around 7.75 million without homes and force about 3.5 million to evacuate. The strategy evolved to shift from precisely bombing industrial sites to a broader area bombing strategy halfway through the campaign, anticipated to start by March 1945. Even before March 1945, the groundwork for these firebombing attacks was laid. Back in 1943, the USAAF conducted tests at Dugway Proving Ground with incendiary bombs on structures resembling German and Japanese housing to gauge how effective these bombs were. The M69 incendiary bombs loaded with napalm proved particularly adept at igniting devastating fires, especially when dropped from B-29s in clusters. Before the large-scale onslaught began in March 1945, piles of these incendiary bombs were gathered in the Mariana Islands based on plans that called for the B-29s to carry four short tons of these weapons on 40% of their missions. Arnold and his team decided to hold off on using these bombs until they could launch a comprehensive firebombing effort that could break through Japanese city defenses with overwhelming force. A few raids were executed to test firebombing on Japanese cities, starting with a small-scale attack on Tokyo in November 1944, which didn't cause much damage. Incendiaries were also deployed in multiple other raids, including a significant raid on the Chinese city of Hankou in December, causing extensive damage, and another against Nagoya, where initial attempts had limited success. However, these attacks began to hint at the potential of firebombing, leading to increased Japanese confidence in their city defenses, a confidence that would soon be tested. On the 19th of February, 
Following a new directive focusing more on firebombing Japanese cities rather than just industrial targets, a massive trial attack was conducted over Tokyo on the 25th of February. Of the 231 B-29s dispatched, 172 reached the city, marking it the largest raid so far by the 21st Bomber Command. The daytime attack, executed at high altitudes in the formation, resulted in the destruction of nearly 28,000 buildings. This raid, deemed a demonstration of the effectiveness of large-scale firebombing, marked a turning point. The precision bombing attempt on a Tokyo aircraft factory on the 4th of March failed, signaling the end of such focused raids by the 21st Bomber Command. Up to that point, civilian casualties had been relatively low, with all prior raids on Tokyo resulting in 1,292 deaths in the city. In early March, LeMay realized that due to bad weather over Japan, which only provided about seven clear days a month and a strong jet stream complicating high-altitude bombing, continuing to target Japanese industries with precision bombing wasn't likely to succeed. Because of these challenges, he shifted focus to directly attacking Japanese cities with the 21st Bomber Command. Even though this decision was made independently by him, it was still within the broad guidelines he had been given. On March 5th, the Bomber Command was informed that major attacks were on hold until March 9th, during which plans for striking Tokyo were finalized. By March 7th, LeMay had committed to a series of heavy raids on targets in Honshu, the main island of Japan, from March 9th to 22nd, as part of the lead-up to the invasion of Okinawa on April 1st. LeMay opted for drastically different tactic for this operation. After reviewing a February 25th raid, it was concluded that bombs were being dropped from too high, making them inaccurate. Attacking from lower altitudes could improve accuracy and allow the planes to carry more bombs despite the increased risk from Japanese defenses, which LeMay viewed as manageable due to ineffective Japanese tactics. Noting better weather conditions at night and more effective navigation via Loren systems after dark, the attacks were scheduled for nighttime. This also meant planes would fly individually to remain undetectable and save fuel, allowing them to double their bomb load. Intelligence had shown Japan had only two night fighter units, considered a minimal threat. LeMay's strategy also involved removing all guns from the B-29s except the tail guns to lighten them for a heavier bomb load. Although the decision for these new tactics was ultimately his, LeMay acknowledged it was a culmination of many officers' ideas. On March 7th, some B-29 crews went on training missions to practice low-altitude navigation and bombing, unaware of the real reason behind it. The commanders of the Bomber Command's three flying wings supported these tactics, but there were concerns about potentially high casualties. Intelligence estimated up to 70% of the bombers might be lost. LeMay discussed these tactics with Brigadier General Loris Norstad, Arnold's chief of staff, but didn't formally seek approval aiming to shield Arnold from potential blame if the attack failed. He informed the 20th Air Force headquarters of his plans on March 8th, choosing a day Arnold and Norstad were away. While there's no evidence LeMay expected any objection to bombing civilian areas, it's possible he worried the headquarters might find the new tactic overly risky. The Japanese military was preparing for significant nighttime attacks on Tokyo by the American Air Forces. Following a series of smaller night raids in late 1944 and early 1945, Japan's 10th Air Division, which defended the Kanto region including Tokyo, focused more on nighttime flight training. One of its flying groups, the 53rd Air Regiment, was even transformed into a unit specializing in night fighting. On the night of March 3rd to 4th, the Japanese picked up American radio signals suggesting a major night exercise by the 21st Bomber Command, leading them to anticipate imminent large-scale night raids. Despite this, they did not foresee the Americans switching to bombing from lower altitudes, a tactic for which Tokyo's defenses were unprepared. In charge of Tokyo's air defense was the Eastern District Army's Kanto Air Defense Sector, given top priority for aircraft and anti-aircraft guns. The 1st Anti-Aircraft Division managed the anti-aircraft guns in central Honshu, including 780 guns alongside a searchlight-equipped regiment. American intelligence assessed that Tokyo's defense resources at the time included 331 heavy and 307 light anti-aircraft guns. The defense also relied on a network of picket boats, radar stations, and lookout posts to detect incoming raids. However, due to radar shortages and outdated fire control equipment, the effectiveness of the anti-aircraft units against nighttime attacks was compromised. Most of the 10th Air Division's 210 combat planes were designed for day fighting, 
with only 25 or 26 night fighters in the 53rd Air Regiment, which faced challenges in adapting to their new role, partly because of an exhausting training schedule. Tokyo's civil defenses were equally underwhelming. The city's fire department had about 8,000 firefighters distributed across 287 stations but lacked modern firefighting tools. Their tactics were also ineffective against the types of bombs being used. Over 140,000 neighborhood firefighting groups had been set up, involving around 2.75 million civilians, but they too were poorly equipped for the job. In terms of shelters, most houses had only simple dugouts nearby, and while efforts were made to stop fire from spreading, including the destruction of over 200,000 homes to create fire breaks, debris was often left uncleared, providing additional fuel for fires. The government had urged children and non-essential workers to leave Tokyo, leading to 1.7 million evacuees by March 1945. However, the city's population remained high as many people moved there from poorer rural areas during the same period. On March 8, LeMay gave the green light for a significant firebombing assault on Tokyo, targeting a specific area for the following night. This area, labeled Zone 1 by the U.S. Air Force, spanned roughly 4 by 3 miles in the northeastern part of Tokyo. It included neighborhoods mostly inhabited by working-class folks and craftsmen crossed by the Sumida River and housed about 1.1 million people, making it one of the world's most crowded places. Interestingly, Zone 1 wasn't packed with big industry but did have many small factories contributing to Japan's war effort. Given the construction materials of wood and bamboo and the building's proximity to one another, the area was particularly prone to fire. This vulnerability was something the United States Intelligence, specifically the Office of Strategic Services, had noted. Remembering the significant damage from the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake fires, the instructions to the B-29 bomber crews clarified that destroying the small factories was a key goal, but causing civilian casualties to disrupt production at larger facilities was also an objective. They were to bomb from heights between 5,000 to 7,000 feet, a sweet spot that would protect them from Japanese anti-aircraft fire. Due to security concerns linked to atomic bomb developments, LeMay couldn't personally lead the raid and assigned Brigadier General Thomas S. Power that responsibility. This change, along with the strategy of bombing from lower altitudes and leaving some gunners behind, stirred unease among the airmen used to different tactics and the camaraderie full crews. In preparation, 21st Bomber Command's maintenance teams had a 36-hour push to ready as many aircraft as possible, achieving an 83% availability rate, well above the usual 60%. A total of 346 B-29s were equipped for the raid, loaded with a mix of M-47 napalm bombs and M-69 cluster bombs tailored to start unmanageable fires. The bombers were scheduled to leave in waves from their bases, starting at 5.35 p.m. local time on March 9 and facing turbulence en route, though Tokyo's weather was clear, aiding the initial bombers with good visibility and challenging conditions due to cold and high winds. The first B-29s that reached Tokyo were tasked with guiding the rest, equipped differently to prioritize communication over bombing. Despite these careful arrangements, this guiding approach didn't turn out to be as useful as hoped, a reflection perhaps of the complexities involved in such a massive and intricately planned operation. The attack on Tokyo began just after midnight on March 10th, with the first bombs dropping at 12.08 a.m. local time. The operation kicked off with Pathfinder bombers from the 73rd and 313th Bombardment Wings leading the way. These Pathfinders were piloted by the wing's top crews and laid out fires in an X shape across Tokyo. This X became the guide for the rest of the attacking force, which was instructed to hit different parts of this shape target to maximize the raid's damage. The American bombers then widened their focus to hit other parts of Tokyo as the fires spread. One noteworthy B-29, flown by a man named Powers, circled Tokyo for an hour and a half, mapping the fire spread with a team of cartographers on board. This intense bombing raid lasted for about two hours and 40 minutes. As the raid went on, smoke covered Tokyo, reducing visibility significantly. This smoke led some American bombers to hit areas of Tokyo that weren't initially targeted. Plus, the heat from the fires caused turbulence affecting the later waves of bombers, and some crew members had to wear oxygen masks due to the smell of burning. In total, 279 B-29 bombers attacked Tokyo, dropping 1,665 short tons of bombs. 
There were also 19 super fortresses that couldn't make it to Tokyo and instead hit alternative targets or turned back due to mechanical issues or pilots, fears of being shot down. Despite Tokyo's defenses being on high alert, they were caught off guard by the attack. Picket boats did spot the incoming bombers, but their warnings weren't effectively communicated due to poor radio reception. Even when B-29s were detected nearby before the raid, they were mistakenly believed to be on reconnaissance missions, and Japanese radar continued to search for planes at higher altitudes, missing the approaching bombers. The defense units weren't efficiently coordinated, and the first alarm went off at 12.15 a.m., right as bombs began to fall on Tokyo. Despite their efforts, the Japanese defense could not effectively counter the raid. American bombers did face anti-aircraft fire, but it was misdirected, failing to effectively target the bombers' altitudes. The defensive efforts led to 12 B-29s being shot down and another 42 damaged. Notably, no B-29 was downed by Japanese fighters, which struggled without guidance from radar stations and coordination with ground defenses. Of the American bombers that were brought down, five managed to land in the sea, with their crews being rescued by U.S. Navy submarines. The casualties on the American side included 96 airmen killed or missing and six wounded or injured. The surviving B-29s made it back to their bases in the Mariana Islands between the early and late morning hours of March 10th, many showing the wear of their mission with signs of ash streak from the fires they had caused in Tokyo. In northeastern Tokyo, Fires spread quickly and uncontrollably, overwhelming the fire department within just 30 minutes of the outbreak. The situation deteriorated so fast that after only an hour, firefighters shifted their focus from battling the blaze to leading people to safety and rescuing those in peril. This tragic event saw the loss of over 125 firefighters, 500 civil guards assisting them, and the destruction of 96 fire engines. The fires, fueled by American incendiary devices and fanned by strong winds, combined into enormous firestorms that moved northwest, obliterating nearly everything in their path except for stone buildings. By an hour after the attack began, most of eastern Tokyo was either destroyed or aflame, with temperatures in some places soaring up to 1,800 degrees. Historian Richard B. Frank has highlighted that survival meant recognizing immediately that the situation was beyond hope and fleeing was the only option. Despite early advisories for civilians to evacuate, many delayed, and those who stayed behind or tried to combat the fires had almost no chance of survival. The traditionally prepared foxholes near homes provided no shelter from the firestorm, leading to numerous deaths by burning or suffocation. As the disaster unfolded, civilians desperately tried to escape through the blinding smoke and encroaching flames, with thousands succumbing to the fire or dying from suffocation as the firestorm consumed the oxygen. The intense heat caused unprecedented phenomena, such as clothing igniting spontaneously and liquefied window glass raining down, inflicting severe injuries. Efforts to maintain cohesion among neighborhood associations were futile in the chaos, and many families were separated. Visibility was near zero, and evacuation routes were quickly blocked by the spreading fires, leading to deadly stampedes towards supposed safety. In one of the raid's most horrific incidents, a B-29 bomber dropped its entire payload onto a crowd on the Kototoi Bridge, resulting in hundreds of casualties. Attempts to find refuge in parks, temples, or canals often ended tragically with smoke inhalation and the firestorm's heat claiming many lives. For example, over a thousand individuals perished after seeking shelter in a school's swimming pool, only to be boiled alive as the water heated. The fire eventually ceased on the morning of March 10th, halting when it encountered larger open spaces or the Nakagawa Canal. The aftermath was grim, with thousands more dying from injuries in the following days. In response to the catastrophe, Tokyo's community united to aid the survivors, with emergency shelters established and many refugees taken in by neighboring prefectures. Yet, the extensive damage led to a significant exodus, with over a million people leaving Tokyo, and no efforts made to restore services in the most affected areas. The number of lives lost during the Tokyo bombing on March 10th varies widely depending on who you ask. Official records say 79,466 bodies were found, but it's believed many were never recovered. The city's health director estimated around 83,600 died and about 40,918 were injured. Meanwhile, the Tokyo Fire Department's figures are even higher, suggesting 97,000 deaths and 125,000 injuries. The police in Tokyo guessed the toll to be around 124,711, either killed or injured. However, 
A post-war United States review suggested about 87,793 died and 40,918 were hurt, highlighting that most victims were women, children, and the elderly. Historian Richard Frank, in 1999, mentioned that experts usually think the death toll was between 90,000 to 100,000, though some say it could be much more. Edwin P. Hoyt, in 1987, claimed 200,000 might have died, and Mark Selden, in 2009, believed the real number could be several times higher than the usually cited 100,000. The Tokyo Memorial Hall lists 105,400 individuals based on ashes kept or claimed there. But since many remains were never found, the actual death count is likely higher. The fact that people were constantly moving in and out of Tokyo, combined with complete communities being wiped out and records destroyed, means we'll probably never know the exact number of deaths. Many of the bodies that were found ended up in mass graves, unidentified. Others who tried to find safety in rivers were washed out to sea and also never found. Efforts to retrieve bodies stopped 25 days after the raid. The destruction was immense, with 267,171 buildings leveled. That's a quarter of all buildings in Tokyo then, leaving over a million people homeless. Major districts and several other city parts saw half of their buildings gone, totaling an area of 15.8 square miles, 41 square kilometers. This raid caused more destruction and loss of life than any other single air raid during World War II. Even when comparing it to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki individually, the aftermath of the raid severely disrupted Japan's war economy, notably through the damage it caused and how it impacted worker attendance in Tokyo. LeMay and Arnold viewed the bombing operation on March 10th as a significant victory, influenced by the pilot reports and the severe damage depicted in reconnaissance photos from that day. Arnold commended LeMay, stating, This mission shows your crews have the courage for anything. The aircrew involved were also proud of their achievements. A review by the 21st Bomber Command credited the extensive damage to a targeted approach in a specific area. With the bombers achieving their objectives quickly and under strong wind conditions over Tokyo. During the war, there was little debate in the United States concerning whether the attack on Tokyo on March 10th or the broader strategy of firebombing Japanese cities was ethical. This strategy received widespread support among American leaders and the public. Historian Michael Howard highlighted that this support reflected the limited options available at the time to conclude the war swiftly. Leaders like Arnold and LeMay believed these raids were crucial to save American lives by accelerating the conclusion of the war, a viewpoint President Franklin D. Roosevelt likely shared. Although the Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson was disturbed by the Americans' lack of concern over the bombing of Tokyo, he permitted such operations to continue until the conclusion of the war. The attack on Tokyo was followed by similar bombings in Nagoya, Osaka, Kobe, and again in Nagoya during March. A specific precision attack on an aircraft engine factory in Nagoya later in March did not proceed as planned. These firebombing efforts only halted once the Bomber Command exhausted its supply of incendiary devices. The March attacks on Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe collectively raised over 31 square miles of these cities. The death toll in Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe was significantly lower than in Tokyo's case, partly because the Japanese authorities had prepared better after underestimating the threat of firebombing. Initially, the Japanese government attempted to conceal the true extent of the March 10th raid, but eventually resorted to using it for propaganda purposes, emphasizing the massive destruction to incite public outrage against the U.S. Despite this, detailed casualty reports were scarce and the few photos shared publicly showed minimal damage. When the Japanese government's broadcaster Radio Tokyo covered the attack, they branded it slaughter bombing. The morale of Japanese civilians significantly declined, realizing the dire situation of the war. The government's efforts to bolster morale with repression and propaganda were not very effective. Despite the catastrophic raid, the improvements to Tokyo's defenses were minimal afterward. The Japanese military struggled with night air defenses until the end of the war in August 1945. From April to mid-May, the 21st Bomber Command concentrated on targeting airfields in southern Japan to support the invasion of Okinawa. Starting May 11th, they shifted focus to precision bombing during favorable weather conditions and night firebombing raids on cities at other times. Additional attacks on Tokyo ensued, with the final raid occurring on the night of May 25th to 26th, leaving half of the city in ruins and over 4 million people homeless. After assessing the extensive damage, Tokyo was excluded from the list of targets. 
By the end of the war, 75% of the Bomber Command's missions had been firebombing operations. After the war ended, the bodies that had initially been placed in mass graves were exhumed and cremated. The ashes then found a resting place in a charnel house situated in Yokoamicho Park in Sumida, a site first established to house the remains of 58,000 people who perished in the 1923 earthquake. Since 1951, every year on March 10th, a Buddhist ceremony is held to remember the anniversary of the raid. In addition, a number of small memorials have sprung up throughout the area, impacted by the raid over the years. The Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly went on to declare March 10th as Tokyo Peace Day in 1990. However, few other memorials dedicated to commemorating the attack were built in the years following the war. In the 1970s, there was a push to build an official Tokyo Peace Museum to honor the raid, but this plan was shelved by the Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly in 1999. Instead, the Dwelling of Remembrance Memorial, remembering civilians who died in the raid, was erected in Yoko Amicho Park and unveiled in March 2001. A citizens group, spearheaded by writer Katsumoto Saotome, who had been a leading figure in the campaign for the Tokyo Peace Museum, set up the privately funded center of the Tokyo Raids and War Damage in 2002. As of 2015, this center stood as Japan's primary source of information on the firebombing raids. The Edo Tokyo Museum also has a small exhibit on the air raids. Scholar Kerry Karakas has suggested that Japan's subdued official recognition of the raid stems from a reluctance to admit that Japan was the first to launch air raids on cities in Asia. According to Karakas, the Japanese government prefers to focus on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki because it aligns with a narrative that portrays Japanese as victims. In 2007, survivors and family members affected by the March 10th raid sued for compensation and an apology from the Japanese government, accusing it of committing a war crime and arguing against the 1951 Treaty of San Francisco, which relinquished their right to seek reparation from the U.S. government. They also contended that the Japanese government had discriminated by compensating military victims and their families, but not civilians. The government maintained it was under no obligation to compensate victims of air raids. In 2009, the Tokyo District Court ruled in favor of the government. Since then, there has been a public campaign urging the Japanese government to enact legislation to compensate civilian survivors of the raid. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.